Hello, my fellow oddities. I'm Nick McBride. Uh, my professional expertise lies in the realm of science, biotechnology, and entrepreneurship. Uh, tonight, I'm going to tell you a story that highlights the importance of using critical evaluation to navigate the world around us and to tell truth from fiction. What? <laughs> so the practice of colonization has rightly gotten a bad rap in recent times. Before the economically powerful nations started caring deeply about indigenous people, it was all the rage. Uh, we started doing that, right? Did we start? Caring about them? Okay. Empires were being built and greatly enriched by their fortunes abroad. Um, Scotland, in particular, had developed some pretty serious colonization FOMO and wanted to get in on the action. And when the Spanish American Wars of Independence fractured Spanish control over South and Central America, as shown, um, this seemed like a golden opportunity for some. Uh, despite these regions, slightly pesky and annoying um, newfound habit of Republican self-governance. So enter His Serene Highness, Gregor I. He's the newly appointed Kazik of the Central American country of Poyais. Gregor MacGregor returned to his ancestral home of Scotland and Britain as a decorated general, having served the British Army in the Napoleonic Wars, and venturing abroad to purportedly become the right-hand man of Simon Bolivar himself during the Spanish-American Wars of Independence, where his effort was rewarded with a caziquedom, apparently. Uh, by the way, the title cazique was originally used to denote leaders of indigenous groups in the Caribbean. Uh, the Spanish took this word and kind of smeared it around the Americas and ultimately were using it to refer to um, any indigenous or local leader. This is a picture of uh, one famous cazique, Tupac Amaru II. He's an Incan revolutionary, and later became the namesake of musical icon Tupac Amaru Shakur. So our Scottish cazique of Poyais was now seeking investment and settlers to develop his new kingdom in the appetizingly named Mosquito Coast of Honduras. <laughs> He especially sought out his native Scots as they would have, quote, the hardiness and character to develop the new country. Uh, stories of the agriculture and wealth, uh, agriculture and natural wealth of Poyais were aided by the account of one Captain Thomas Strangeways. Uh, he painted this depiction and penned a long description of the country. Um, in excruciating detail, he pointed out the vast profits that could be reaped from investment and settlement in Poyais uh, by taking advantage of the agriculture abundance, by becoming a craftsman or artist in the bustling and colonnaded capital city, or simply picking up the globules of gold that you could find in the riverbeds. <laughs> a very believable story. Uh, soon the buzz about this promising nation of Poyais was everywhere. And from the streets of London to Edinburgh, uh, you could hear minstrels singing about this newly revealed kingdom and all its, of its, its abundance. Londoners bought engraved images of Poyais's verdant shores by the thousands. You could also buy Poyasian land certificates and currency. And in 1822, uh, the Poyais government bonds were actually floated on the London Stock Exchange. The uh, estimates of the peak market value of these bonds are as high as 4.4 billion US dollars when adjusted for inflation. The first lucky emigrants embarked from London on September 1822. Uh, and they, went, they set sail amid great fanfare and an announcement from our esteemed Kazik that the women and children would be granted free passage on this inaugural emigration to Poyais. They were led by ex-British Army officer Hector Hall, who had been granted a vast 13,000-acre estate in Poyais. There was somewhat less enthusiasm when the settlers arrived on the Mosquito Coast after a difficult two-month ocean voyage to find absolutely nothing but swamp and dense jungle. There was no Poyais, 
Uh, it was totally made up. It was a figment of Gregor McGregor's fanciful imagination. <laughs> it was much like the OG Fire Festival. I'm sure they took a lot of inspiration. <laughs> it was, however, the rainy season, bringing with it many, uh, surprisingly enough, many mosquitoes, <laughs> carrying malaria, yellow fever, and other diseases. The unfortunate settlers were woefully unequipped to start a colony from scratch, having thought they were heading to a already prosperous modern city. Um, they're most definitely not helped further when their leader, Hector Hall, wised up a little bit sooner to what was going on, decided to set sail in the middle of the night with <laughs> most of their provisions still on board the ship. <laughs> and thus he left the settlers to their inevitable fate. Ultimately, two-thirds of the 270 settlers who actually made it all the way to the Mosquito Shore perished. When the harrowing tale finally made its way back to Britain, it actually had remarkably little impact on McGregor's Poyet's company. <laughs> McGregor, in fact, had moved on to Paris where he was hawking the Poyet scheme anew for French settlers. McGregor, it turns out, had a much more colorful history than he let on. He was descended from a long line of McGregors, chiefly notable as Highland cattle rustlers and outlaws. <laughs> McGregor's British Army career had come to a premature end when his senior officers disliked him so much that they refunded the 1,350 pounds he paid for the rank of captain and just sent him home from the war. They're like, just, just go home. We don't want you around. Uh, in 1811, McGregor's rich wife, whom he'd been mooching off of, died abruptly. And finding himself suddenly penniless, he decided to try his luck as a mercenary amid the chaotic revolutions happening in the Americas. Upon arrival, he somehow convinced Francisco de Miranda, pictured on the left, uh, to give him command of an entire cavalry battalion. And after making another advantageous marriage to Simone Bolivar's cousin, Josefa, pictured on the right, he was promoted to brigadier general. And this is pretty impressive, I think. Like he, This guy must have some serious charisma. He goes and he just talks his way into being in command of hundreds of men. And here I haven't yet got a full-time job since coming to San Francisco. <laughs> By the way, if you've got any, uh, please see me after the show. McGregor was not popular with his officers, who used terms like bluffer, quixote, and an aberration of human intellect to describe, <laughs> to describe him and his leadership style. <laughs> Nevertheless, the troops under McGregor did score some notable victories, uh, particularly a difficult fighting retreat across hundreds of miles pursued by two Spanish royalist armies. Um, McGregor's outnumbered forces eventually lay in wait and ambushed the Spanish cavalry in a marsh, scoring a decisive victory. This was McGregor's crowning military achievement. Knowing how to run away is one skill McGregor put to good use. Poyes was also not McGregor's first attempt to start a nation. McGregor tried to establish the Republic of the Floridas after seizing the pirate and slave smuggling haven of Amelia Island. He had raised 160000 from investors for the venture, but he squandered all this money and instead paid the troops with Amelia dollars, which he had printed the night before. <laughs> Eventually, United States forces took over Amelia Island long after McGregor had already fled to the Bahamas. So back in Paris, French authorities were a bit more suspicious of our esteemed Kazik after receiving a deluge of passport applications to travel to a country that they had never heard of. <laughs> Uh, McGregor was arrested and imprisoned for seven months in Paris. However, uh, the ultimate result was him being acquitted of all charges. Not only that, but because of the trial, many backers of the Poyet scheme were able to write off their losses as being due to embezzlement from McGregor's right-hand man and not to the fact that Poyet had never existed at all. 
So McGregor got away scot-free and returned to Edinburgh. There he continued to milk the Poyer scheme for about 12 more years, uh, with rather diminished returns, but seemingly few consequences. McGregor's marketing of Poyer's had been so effective, the publications under the assumed name of Thomas Strangeways, the hired minstrels out on the streets, uh, that a host of other con artists actually set up offices and began selling Poyer's real estate as well. Even today, you can pay $240 for entry into the adoptive citizenship program offered by RepublicaPoyes.org, <laughs> inclusive of, a, of your very own Poyer passport. I swear I had nothing to do with this. In 1838, following the death of his wife, Josefa, McGregor returned to Venezuela, where he was welcomed as a hero by fellow soldiers from his glory days and given a military pension. He lived out his remaining years thrilling the elite of Caracas, telling wondrous tales of his daring adventures at dinner parties. I imagined it looked something like this, or at least this is how McGregor would describe it if he were alive today. One thing is for sure, Gregor McGregor always knew how to make an entrance, and especially when to make his exit. Uh, so I'll raise a glass to each one of us who can still aspire to become the life of the party despite all of our terrible and notorious faults. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, how are those glasses doing? Are you getting ready to need a refill? We are going to take a wee cocktail break in just a second. But before we do that, I need to remind you of the adventures of our intrepid mascot, our spokesbeast, Harvey Wolpertinger, Azolda, producer of San Francisco Odd Salon, makes these by hand. There are hundreds of tiny adventure Harveys in the wild, and we have made a map. Thank you to Odslan fellow Barbara North. And we have plotted um, Harvey's adventures all over the world. He has been to all seven continents. Just recently, he was at the Forbidden City and at the Great Wall of China. He was in Utah admiring the grand landscape. And he was in the airport in Haiti. And he also had a very close call at Yosemite. <laughs> when uh, we thought it was a good idea to set down a little Harvey for a photo op among the land of chipmunks. <laughs> and it went a little something like this. <laughs> Luckily, there was dense shrubbery and he lost Harvey for a split second and he was recaptured. So he has, he has lived to go on another adventure. Um, I encourage you to adopt your own adventure, Harvey. He fits in your pocket, he goes anywhere. Beth has them over at the Odd Shop, where she and Dan would be happy to sell you stickers or glasses or your own Harvey or these beautiful little compasses we have. And if you do go home with a Harvey, make sure that you hashtag your pictures with Adventure Harvey so that we can find your adventures on Instagram or Facebook, and we will share them here. So for now, Get the, to the uh, odd shop, pick yourself up a little something, and when we come back, we will have three more stories of body snatchers, of shenanigans to solve horrific deadly mine, uh, mine flooding, and finally, a tale of a double agent. So grab a cocktail, visit the table, come right back, and we'll be back in about 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 